Well, we have a lot of ground to cover in this passage, a lot of chapters. Uh, some of it's tough, even maybe disturbing. Betrayal, murder, cold-blooded revenge, sexual assault. This stuff is in our world all around us, and it can be hard to think about, hard to hear and accept that these things happen. Think of all the sexual assault stuff that we hear about all the time in our society. Um, there are documentaries like Surviving R. Kelly, which is about a singer who is involved in the sexual assault of a lot of young women, many of them underage, that he actually held captive and used for his own purposes for periods of time. There are famous people in Hollywood and even some members of the royal family who've been accused of sexual assault in various capacities and some well-known people serving prison time for sexual assault. There's the whole Me Too movement that is taking place in our world. You know, no one in the world is immune from suffering. Statistically, there's gonna be somebody listening to me who has been the victim of sexual assault or the victim of betrayal and pain at the hands of someone else. It's just part of the human condition. Um, we are all victims of the hurtful behavior of others. We can also be the perpetrators of hurtful behavior toward others. Um, one person said that we all suffer the cross. The thief who was guilty and unrepentant got the cross. The thief who was guilty and repentant got the cross and then so too did the perfect son of God. In these chapters, we have people who have done wrong and who get consequences. We have people like Tamar who have not done wrong in the particular situation and yet are terribly hurt. And we have people who did wrong and repented and who also have to face consequences people like David. But underneath is the consistent love and mercy of God reaching out to his own. According to a commentary, there are about 15, maybe 10 to 15 years between the events of chapter 12 and the events of chapter 13. And this series of painful situations begins with the uh, lust of um, Amna for his half-sister Tamar. Amna is the oldest of David's sons. He would be, in many ways in the world's view at least, the crown prince. He seems to have been a selfish and pitiless man with some very perverse appetites. He wants what is forbidden to him by both nature and the law. He wants his sister. Um, and his cousin, a cousin, helps to him plan this. And he even gets uh, David involved by asking David to send Tamar to care for him, pretending that he is sick. Now, the request itself seems a little bit odd, but no one seems overly concerned about it. And um, Tamar very kindly goes and makes her brother a meal, and in return, she is raped by Amna. Now, clearly, he does not love her, for as soon as he's finished with her, he says he hates her, and he throws her out. He diminishes her, calling her this woman. He bolts the door behind her and she goes home weeping with her garment torn. Sin has the ability to harm many, the one who has sinned and those who are the victims of it. And Tamar is damaged in body and spirit and in soul and she will never be the same. Absalom, her brother, takes her in. His response is a mixture of kindness and actions that are not in her best interests. He takes her in to live with him, but he tells her to keep quiet about what happened. This deprives her of the right of justice. Absalom is already planning how he is going to respond to Amnon and what he has done. Now, David hears about this and he's furious, but he does nothing. He's totally paralyzed in this situation. This series of events is part of the consequences in the life of David for his sin with Bathsheba and the death of Uriah at his hand. He knows that. He received mercy from God for his sexual sin, but he also repented. There's no evidence that Amnon did. David maybe felt he is not in a position to do anything because after all, in his own sin, he did something kind of similar, but he fails to parent and he fails to respond as king in a situation that's clearly involving breaking of the law. Tamar is left with no justice coming to her from the king, her father. If you have been subjected to abuse and your parent has failed to step in and protect you, you will begin to grasp some of her pain. It says that she remained desolate. In contrast, um, 
or in the context rather of the culture, that means she didn't marry. She remained in mourning for what she had lost. This event changed the entire course of her life. Absalom is very angry, but he waits coldly for two years. His anger festers toward Amna and likely also toward David. In fact, it's probable that his rebellion against his father begins at this point with David's failure to act. Having waited two years with Amnon thinking the whole thing is forgotten and he got away with it, Absalom holds a party and he invites David, but David says he's not going to go. So Amnon asks, so Absalom asks Amnon to come instead and then he commands his men to kill Amnon at his signal. David originally hears all of his sons are dead and then that it's only the one, Amnon. And he's told that by Jonadab, the son of David's brother. So clearly this was um, this cousin of Absalom was in on the whole thing because he knew that only one son was dead, not all of them. David weeps, mourning over the death of his son and his other son, Absalom, flees because of what he has done. And he goes to his mother's father, his grandfather. Again, there's a, a wishy-washy response from David. He knows Amna got the punishment that was rightly his under the law. If you rape Death is the just punishment. But also, um, he knows that Absalom was not entitled to be the one to take that revenge. Absalom out acted outside of due legal process. But David does nothing. He is not behaving as a father or as a king. He is leaving his children uncontrolled and unpunished for their lawbreaking. And the consequences of sin are building and spreading. Now, I think David could maybe not bring himself to deal with Amnon and Absalom as they deserve under the law. He couldn't bring himself to sentence them to death. Although he knew they had not repented, he couldn't tell his sons about his own sin. Maybe thought if he brought up theirs that they would throw his back in his face should they happen to know about it. So he did nothing. He did not beg them to repent. He did not confront them. And yet he knows why all of this is happening. The consequences here are due to David as a result of his own sin. This is the sword that Nathan said would not depart from David's house. But that does not absolve these two sons from their personal sin. Each of us has control of what we do and how we behave and are held responsible for that. Just because God allowed sin doesn't mean he approves of it. God never directs people to sin. He is holy and he cannot sin. And through all of this, he loved Absalom and Amna as well as poor Tamar. His love and mercy are available to both the perpetrator of the sin and the victim, but he is also holy. David is sorrowful over the death of Amna, who deserved to die for the rape. He misses Absalom, who is not allowed was not allowed to take revenge on Amnon, which was basically murder, but David does not act to bring him home either. David does nothing. And the damage of all this sin just keeps on growing like a radioactive mushroom cloud. Crafty Joab knows what David wants. He wants Absalom home, but he does not want to have to deal with what Absalom did or make him pay the price for what he did. And so Joab arranges for this woman to come to David with a story that will appeal to him and then get him to bring Absalom home. There's a sentence in the words that David says, or that this woman says to David that jumped out at me. And it's in it's verse 14 of chapter 14. And she says, he, which means the Lord in the context, he devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him. That's in essence what the gospel is. God devises a way so the banished sinner can be brought back. But God's way is to make sure that his holiness is satisfied by the death of Jesus for our sin. Sin is paid for. It's not overlooked. The thing that Joab suggested and what David did in no way dealt with the sin of Absalom. It was just ignored. And they brought him home. So Absalom returns to Jerusalem, but David won't see him. And Absalom is not really restored to a relationship with his father. He's not banished, but he's not accepted either. And for two more years, he doesn't see his father and his anger against David grows. 
Absalom forces the issue by setting fire to the grain belonging to Joab, so Joab will come and see him. And then Absalom asks through Joab to see his father and says that if he is guilty, he should be put to death. David sees him, but doesn't deal with his sin. David is still hiding his head in the sand over the behavior of his children. He's still likely paralyzed by his own shame. Time goes by and we begin chapter 15. Absalom is now actively plotting to take the kingdom from his father. He's going to spend four years systematically working to get the people on his side. He lies about his father. He makes himself approachable. He speaks kindly to the people. He turns on the charm and he wins over the people. And after four years, he goes to Hebron on the pretext of fulfilling a vow. And while there, he proclaims himself king. And an open rebellion against David begins led by his own son. David's life is now in danger from his own son. The first person named that leaves David to go and join the rebellion as Ahithophel, who is David's wise counselor. And that's a huge loss to David. David must have felt the betrayal very deeply, although, of course, it wouldn't have hurt nearly as bad as the betrayal of his own son. David knows he's in danger, and he knows that the city of Jerusalem is in danger as well if he stays there. So he flees. Most of his men and officials go with him, and he takes his wives, but he leaves 10 concubines behind in the palace. Several people are mentioned who go with David. One of them that I love is a guy named Etai, the Gittite. David sees him marching to go with David, and he says, why are you coming? You're a foreigner. You've only been with me a really short time. The passage actually says, you joined me, but yesterday. And Etai has this great response in chapter 15, verse 21. But Ittai replied to the king, as surely as the Lord lives, and as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord the king may be, whether it means life or death, there will your servant be. That's a committed guy. That bit of loyalty must have been hugely encouraging to David. God is providing for him. The priests bring the ark and they follow David, but David sends them back. So drop down to chapter 15, verse 25. Then the king said to Zadok, take the ark of the Lord back into the city. If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it in his dwelling place again. But if he says, I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. David will use the sons of the priests as messengers back and forth to keep him updated as to what is going on in Jerusalem. He knows that the ark is, belongs to the nation, not to him. So he wants it to stay with the nation and the priests then return the ark to Jerusalem. Now this brings us to chapter 15, verse 29. And there is something that happens in the next few verses that change the focus. So I'm just going to end the division right here and tell you that the teaching truth we have learned so far is this. Sin leads to corruption, violence, and death. It's hard to adequately describe the damage of sin. It simply destroys everything. People are damaged in their relationship with God, but also in their relationship with others in their own sense of self or their own value, in their ability to parent correctly or act rightly. We are so damaged in how we think and how we see ourselves and each other that it's impossible to actually overestimate the damage of sin. Whether we are the perpetrator of the evil or the victim, we are damaged. Even if we're just random bystanders or we can suffer the effects of things like natural disaster. Each of us will be at some point the victim and at some point, the perpetrator. God reveals to us the damage of sin, the shame that it brings, the pain and the hurt, in order to show us our need for God. Without the revelation of the consequences of sin, none of us would seek God or willingly accept his salvation. But we not only need salvation from sin as a one-time thing, but ongoing help to deal with the current damage of sin that comes into our lives. We need to seek God for help when we like Tamar, are a victim of sin, or when we, like Amna, are the perpetrator, or when we have been forgiven but are still paralyzed by the shame of what we have done and struggle to act right in situations like David. Are there obsessions in your life 
a desire for something God has denied you that is driving you towards sinful action? Are you in danger of being the perpetrator of damage in the life of someone else because of your unchecked desires? For what pain or shame do you need to go to God today for healing? There is something in your life right now that needs healing. Sin so contaminates all parts of who we are that it is impossible for there not to be something that needs the healing power and restoration of God in your life right now. Sin is inescapable. The damage of sin is pervasive. It touches everything. It contaminates everything. Recognition of that fact is necessary in order for us to turn to God for the help that only he can provide. How are you taking your pain and contaminated bits to God today? So David goes up the Mount of Olives weeping and the people come weeping behind him. And now for the first time in the list of this long woeful behavior, we see someone seek God's help. He has stated, David has stated trust in God's final decision back in verse 25, but now David prays in verse 31 and he says, O Lord, turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. See, David knows one thing. God has not abandoned him. God is still with him, showing mercy and love. And in spite of this painful time in David's life, and so David prays. Just a few moments later, David meets Hushai on the summit of the Mount of Olives. Hushai is in mourning and has come to join David. But David has another idea. See, Hushai is the answer to his prayer. David asks him to go back and join Absalom as a spy in the camp, as a person who will give advice that will offset the advice of Ahithophel and undermine it and advance the cause of David from within the camp of Absalom. And so Hushai goes back and joins Absalom. In chapter 16, David meets Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, and he has brought food and donkeys for the members of David's family to ride. David asks Mephibosheth or asks Ziba where Mephibosheth is, and Ziba tells David that Mephibosheth is staying behind, thinking that today is the day when he is going to get everything that belonged to Saul, maybe even the throne. Now we will find out later that Ziba is trying to curry favor with David here, and he's lying about Mephibosheth and about Mephibosheth's loyalty. But David says in this moment that because of Mephibosheth's, what he feels is his betrayal, that everything that he has previously given to Mephibosheth is now given to Ziba. And that's pretty manipulative of Ziba to use this terrible time in the nation and in the life of David for his own personal gain. But that's what he did. The next person to meet David is a man called Shimei. And he is of the clan from which Saul came. He meets David with, and curses him, pelting him with rocks and dirt. And he's dripping anger and hatred for David. This is in chapter 16. I'm going to start reading at verse 7. And he cursed. As he cursed, Shimei said, Get out, get out, you murderer, you scoundrel. The Lord has repaid you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. The Lord has given the kingdom of, into the hands of your son Absalom. You have come to ruin because you are a murderer. Now, Abishai, one of David's soldiers and the brother of Joab, wants to kill this guy. But David will not allow that. So, uh, verse 10. But the king said, what does this have to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? If he is cursing because the Lord said to him, curse David, who can ask, why do you do this? David then said to Abish Abishai and all his officials, my son, my own flesh and blood is trying to kill me. How much more than this Benjamite? Leave him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord has told him to. It may be the Lord will look upon my misery and restore to me his covenant blessings instead of his curse today. This is a depressing exit from Jerusalem. Talk about a tough day. There's a lot of pain for David. Sin is just wrecking havoc in his family and on his nation. But God is with David in all of this. Now, meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, Hushai joins Absalom and is accepted. And Ahithophel gives his first advice to Absalom. He suggests that Absalom set out, set up a tent on the roof of the palace 
and rape his father's ten concubines where everyone can see what he is doing. This is a terrible scene. This sexual assault of these ten helpless women who belong to his father. But it's a carefully calculated political move. To take the wives or the concubines of a, of a king is symbolic of taking everything that he has. Absalom is making a public statement that he dominates his father and has taken all that is his. And these women pay the price for his public statement. Then Absalom and his advisors decide how to attack David. Ahithophel says Absalom needs to act quickly. He needs to go now and pursue David and take him as fast as possible. And Absalom thinks that this is a good idea. And it is. It's actually very wise counsel. But Absalom decides to ask Hushai for advice as well. And Hushai gives advice that's going to give David the best chance of survival. He says that David is such a successful warrior that Absalom needs a vast army. Hushai advises Absalom to take time and assemble a large force to go after his father. And this way they will have the manpower to take him no matter where David is. But this actually gives David time to get over the river and set up for the attack that's going to come. Absalom takes the advice of Hushai rather than that of Ahithophel. God causes him to do that because God is actively working against Absalom here. There is an account of the men taking the message to David and how they had to hide in a well. But David gets the warning and he crosses the river to at least initially be safe. Ahithophel sees his advice is not taken and he goes and hangs himself. Now some think that he is so proud of his reputation as a wise counselor that the fact that his advice is ignored is just too much for him to take. But others think that he realized that the Lord is working to advance the cause of David by causing Absalom to take advice that would actually lead to his downfall. Realizing he has chosen the losing side in this, Ahithophel kills himself. I don't know which is right, because God doesn't tell us, so you can figure that one out. In chapter 18, a battle commences between David's forces and that of Absalom. David and his army win, defeating the army of Absalom. And as they begin, David gave a, a command regarding his son. He says, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all his men hear him give this instruction. As the battle is fought, Absalom rides under an oak tree. Now, this is not the huge spreading oak tree that we think of, you know, that you see standing in the middle of the lawn in front of an English manor house. This is the scrub oak of Israel, a shorter, lower tree with a much shallower root system. And Absalom, when he rides under it, gets his flowing hair caught in the low-hanging branches of this tree, and his donkey keeps on going, leaving him hanging there. It sounds like it would kind of be a comical scene. One of David's soldiers tells Joab about this, and Joab says, well, why didn't you kill him? And the man says, I'm not going to do that. We all heard what David commanded about his son. Joab seems to think he knows what is best to be done, regardless of what David wanted. And he goes and takes some javelins and kills Absalom while he hangs helpless in the tree. He gets some of his armor bearers to participate in this. And then a trumpet is blown to indicate that the battle is over. Absalom's body is thrown into a pit and covered over with rocks. And then there is this debate about who is going to tell David and how he is to be told about the death of his son. Two men bring news. One of them is a Cushite. This is in chapter 18. And I'm just going to read starting in verse 31. The Cushite arrived and said, My lord the king, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all who rose up against you. And the king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? The Cushite replied, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to harm him be like that young man. And David knows that his son is dead. He goes into a room alone and he weeps for his son. And there is this cry in verse 33. My son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. If only I had died instead of you. Oh Absalom, my son, my son. 
Your heart goes out to David here. His son rebelled and sought his life and was killed in battle. It's a terrible scene. It's heartbreaking. But David has cried out to God and God sustains David and protects him through all of this. David is not, has not dealt rightly with his sons. And the whole situation escalated up into this horrible rebellion and now the death of Absalom. Only God can deal rightly with sin. Even in the pain and trouble David is going through, God is at work. He is sustaining David's life, providing him with people to support and encouraging him. He is frustrating the plans of those who oppose him. The damage sin has brought into the world, into the family of David, is not outside the power of God to redeem and to heal. David remembers where he can go in his pain, and God meets him when David calls on the Lord. There's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else to look but to God. Why did it take David so long to cry to God in his trouble? Well, why does it take me so long? Or you? I mean, what stops us from inviting God into our mess to help us? No one else can help our mess. No one else can heal the damage of sin in our lives, whether we deal with the shame of being a victimizer or the pain of being the victim. There's only one source of healing and restoration, and that is God. And he can heal all of it. But far too often, we try far too long on our own. David wanted his son Absalom restored to him, but he didn't want to deal with the sin of Absalom. And this approach allowed the sin and rebellion of Absalom to increase, as sin does. We can look at Absalom as a picture of each of us before we knew Christ. He is rebelling against the rightful king. He wants to reign himself. And we did the same thing. Before we came, became believers, we rebelled against God, the rightful king, and we wanted to be our own king and run our own lives. The judgment for rebellion against God is death. Absalom died for his rebellion against David, and David was devastated. And he said, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. But of course, David could not take the place of his son in judgment. But God could and did take the place of his rebellious children, dying for us. Jesus, God the Son, died for you. God does devise a means by which the banished one can return, but it's a plan that includes the just fulfillment of the law in terms of the punishment of sin. David could not bring his son home and yet at the same time deal justly with his sin. God can and does. He pays the punishment himself. But there is one thing required. We must be repentant and come to God for help and mercy. Neither Absalom nor Amna repented. There is no healing from the damage of sin without repentance. Sin is terribly damaging. We are deeply broken and so is our world, but there is hope for us. One source of hope and help, and that is God. In him, our brokenness can be healed, our pain reduced or removed, our shame taken away. Whether the victim of sin or the perpetrator, we can be changed and healed. For God devises a way, a just and perfect way, a merciful way for his banished one to be brought home.